Three-in-1. Liturgical attire of Bishop Stefan Wierzbowski from Góra Kalwaria, Poland. Archaeology is a very broad field of science, usually associated with a wide range of research of open space positions, with the exploration of complex stratigraphy and physical work. However, sometimes excavations can be carried out on a much smaller scale, in layers enclosed in an object of the size of a bed. For example, in a sarcophagus. An example of this type of research, bringing a lot to the knowledge of the history and changes in liturgical costumes, were initiated by the local community of Gura Calvaria and carried out by a team of archaeologists from the Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun. The research of the burial of Bishop Stefan Wierzbowski. In 2020, on the occasion of the 350th anniversary of granting municipal rights to Gura Calvaria, the inhabitants of this Mazovian city organized fundraising for the renovation of the sarcophagus of the city's founder, Bishop Stefan Wierzbowski. The work program also included archaeological exploration of the contents of the metal sarcophagus. The first preliminary recognition showed that the bishop was dressed in more than one layer of robes. Under the first chasuble, elements of the second were visible. It was already known back then that the amount of found textiles could be significant and result from the turbulent history of Wierzbowski's burial. The body of the bishop was moved many times, either as a result of historical events or of the goodwill of local notables. Stefan Wierzbowski was born in 1620 and came from a Castellan family with long and noble traditions. The first important ecclesiastical position held by Stefan Wierzbowski was the function of Archdeacon of Łódzk. He was also the administrator of the Łódzk diocese during the vacancy. In 1653 he received a commission for the Kraków canon and in 1660 he was appointed abbot of Paradis. He was also mentioned as the crown referendary. He was nominated to be bishopric of Poznań at the end of 1663. Due to his many important functions, Wierzbowski witnessed many significant events in the history of Poland. It was he who signed the act confirming the abdication of King Jan Kazimierz Vaza and then played a leading role in the election of the new king. From 1673, he sat in the Senate. He settled permanently at first in Warsaw and then in the town Nova Jerozolima, he founded, that is known today as Gura Calvaria. He was the first to accept the title of Bishop of both Poznań and Warsaw. In 1685, he was nominated to become the Archbishopric of Gniezno. The Holy See, however, resisted Stefan's approval for a long time, as in the past he allowed Hieronim Lubomirski to be married despite the incons inconsistency with canon law. He died on March 7th, 1687, in Gura Calvaria, waiting for the papal permission to take the position of the head of the Polish church. According to the deceased last will, the funeral took place three days after his death. The body of the nominee of Gniezno was laid in the parish church of the Holy Cross, under a simple sandstone tablet prepared in advance, on which the bishop ordered the following inscription to be engraved during his lifetime. God, you have forgiven the thief who was hanging with you, and forgive me who was buried here. With time, the Church of the Holy Cross fell into decline due to the lack of funds. It was decided to move the parish church to the so-called Pilate's Town Hall, which properly restored was called under the exaltation of the Holy Cross. At that time, it was decided to move the body of Bishop Wierzbowski there and place it in a crypt located under the presbytery. Immediately after the First World War in 1980, on the initiative of the Marian priests, the bishop's body was ceremonially transferred to the new metal sarcophagus with a glass lid, where it also rests to this day. On the 7th of May 2020, Archaeologists and conservators from the Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun started work to secure and transport the bishop's remains to Torun. At that time, the layers constituting the filling of the sarcophagus were explored. 
During the works, it was discovered that Bishop Stefan Wierzbowski was dressed in three sets of liturgical vestments, which included three silk chasubles, two dalmatics, two stalls, three manipules, two linen shirts, a linen rochet, a cassock, a pair of gloves, a pair of shoes, a headdress, and pieces of stockings. The mummified body was placed on a 20th century mattress filled with wood chips. Inside the tomb, devotional items in the form of two rosaries, one wooden and one plastic, as well as a scapular, were also found. In addition, the sarcophagus contained a sealed, fabric-covered capsule with a letter confirming the bishop's reburial in 1918. The analysis of individual elements of clothing brought interesting conclusions, contradicting the image of Stefan Wierzbowski's originally modest burial. With development of Christianity on subsequent areas in Europe, as well as the increase in the dominant position of the Catholic Church, it was necessary to create a set of unified guidelines on various aspects related to the functioning of religious communities. These changes also include the evolution of liturgical vestments. For centuries, dress was a determinant of belonging to a specific social group. Hence, the liturgical dress personified the dignity and holiness of Jesus Christ, whom the earthly priests represented. The priest who celebrated the liturgy stood in front of the altar in a festive costume, which was composed mainly of a chasuble, an alb, a maniple, and a stall. These elements are called paraments and are usually stored in the sacristy. The history of these paraments is not as turbulent as the more general history of secular fashion. Its most intensive development took place from the middle of the first millennium. In the second millennium, it can be more generally considered that any changes introduced were only cosmetic treatments, improving the cut, significantly affecting their functionality and wearing comfort. Chasubles took their oldest form from the circle-shaped travel coats popular in Greece and Rome with an opening for the head, hugging the whole body but without sleeves. These coats were called penula. They often had callus, that is, a hood. The frequent Latin name for this garment is casula, hence the French chasuble or German die Kassel. Over time, these forms have been replaced by others. As many as three chasubles were placed in the bishop's sarcophagus. The outer chasuble, the youngest, dating from the 18th century, was in the best condition. Cream-colored, the embroidery on the pretext depicted flora motifs. The restoration work was based only on the removal of impurities and the dirt from the surface of the chasuble. The intermediate chasuble was in the worst condition of all three. Only fragments of the lining and linen remnants remain, not having enough features to determine the color of the garment, especially put it on a duplicate like third chasuble or a dalmatic. The third chasuble was the richest in the set, made of gold head, that is, a thread with a metal braid. It was in a very good condition, allowing for a duplicate after previously carried conservation works aimed at restoring the original characteristics of fabrics, strength as well as softness. The tapes decorating the chasuble are the so-called greenies or zielonki in Polish, a lace made of copper threads which, when deposited, oxidize to green color. In the days of their use, cleaned and polished copper threads reflected light in a cheaper imitation of gold. The pretext of the chasuble, that is, its central element, was decorated with a floral motif, of which the flowers were also embroidered with a metal braided thread. Another element of liturgical attire accompanying clergy today during the administration of the sacraments and during the celebration of the Holy Mass is the stole. It takes the form of a sash worn around the neck by the priest. The stole like the cloth slung around the priest's neck like a chain, is also commonly regarded as a symbol of the burden resting on the shoulders of the clergyman as a guide for the faithful. The rich ornaments of the stall were also explained by creating a symbol of restoration 
as a result of the erasure of the original sin, of the innocence previously lost in Eden. During the transfer of the bishop's body, two stalls were placed in the sarcophagus. The first one did not need it any conservation works, being only dirted with dust. The second one is part of the set with the third chasuble and the second maniple, and is made in the same technique of gold head, placed on a linen lining. The petals of the stall additionally contained a stiffener between the lining and the layer of gold head, being additionally decorated at the edges with aforementioned greeny lace tapes with crosses inside. The cross was also placed in the middle of the stall, in the place where the priest hung the stall on his neck. Somewhat forgotten today, and for hundreds of years present during the liturgy, is a maniple. It was a band worn by the priest on the left arm during the celebration of the Holy Mass, at the both ends of which there were sewn or embroidered crosses. Sometimes, in terms of form and ornamentation, it was a set along with a stall. The genesis of a maniple could be handkerchiefs used by the first Christian clergy to wipe sweat, tears, or to clean up liturgical vessels. The maniple were a very impractical element, hanging them over the arm restricted the priest's movements. This significantly contributed to the fact that, as a result of post-conciliar changes, the maniples became only an optional element of liturgical attire. It was precisely this restriction of the movement of one hand that was to symbolize the sacrifices brought about by the priesthood, as well as the fruits of these hardships. Sometimes, maniples are also interpreted as a symbol of scarves and cords accompanying Christ during the way of the cross. The first maniple is the last part of the set. It is made in the same technique as the chasuble and the stall. A layer of gold head was sewn onto the linen lining. Additionally, thick linen stiffeners were placed in the maniple's petals between the lining and the outer layer. Green forage tapes with crosses in the middle were placed on the edges of the petals. Similarly decorated maniples were found during the research of Stuchen crypts in 2011-2018. to The second maniple was made of green silk, embroidered with yellowish floral motifs. Bright metal braided lace was sewn onto the edges of the petals. Originally, the Dalmatics was a secular garment of the inhabitants of Dalmatia, from which it took its name. From the 2nd century onwards, it was popular in the same capacity in other provinces of the Roman Empire. From the first half in the 4th century, it became an element of the liturgical attire of the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Pope. By the decision of New Year's Eve I, the Dalmatic became a proper garment for Roman deacons, and in the following centuries, also for the rest of the deacons. It was a long and wide robe, not girded, with short and wide sleeves. Over time, it was shortened, and for easier application, it was cut on both sides, including the sleeves. In antiquity, it was white in color, with red vertical stripes running down from the shoulders down, both in front and behind. From the 18th century, its color began to be adapted to the color of the chasuble. Thanks to the sufficient number of preserved fragments and the performed conservation works, it was possible to make a duplicate of the bishop's dalmatics. At the time of use, it was probably white or light cream in color, but due to being soaked in dirt, the fabric was colored in shades of yellow and brown. According to the rules in force, the deceased, regardless of gender or social status, would be dressed in a simple shirt for a funeral dress known as Giezwo or Czechwo. Traditionally, the elderly and adults were dressed in black or white shirts, young people in green or blue, and children in white or red. This custom also applied to the clergy, an example of which is the presence of two linen shirts on the body of Bishop Wyszbowski. The preserved fragments, in particular, of the shirt neckline indicate the sophistication of tailoring craftsmanship. The shirt was wrinkled many times. After folding, two stitches were pulled through the fabric, which, when tightened, additionally strengthened the creasing at the lace adorning the neckline. 
As far as the accessories for basic clothing, which includes zucchetto, shoes and gloves are concerned, it is worth paying special attention to the last. Gloves made of thick silk were embroidered with a thread with a metal braid. The surface was carefully embroidered with a Christogram motif. For the scientists and students from the Nikolaus Copernicus University, a springboard from the conservation of fabrics was the conservation of the mummified body itself. After disinfection with a surfacant, the mummy was cleaned of dirt and the remains of clothing damaged by decay and the action of both insects and animals. During the previous transfer of the bishop's mummy, his back was broken, the absence of which opened a large hole. Inside has accumulated filling constituting products of decomposition, wood shavings, and pieces of debris. Interestingly, there were also scraps of printed paper inside. After the initial manual cleaning of the body, the remains were placed in a vacuum and then repeatedly soaked with leather impregnation surfacant, which helped to make the skin soft again, and thus to pull out the remnants of the dead insects. The conservation of archaeological fabrics is an essential element to learn about the history of late medieval and modern costume science. Thanks to the examination of liturgical vestments, the funerary attire of Bishop Wierzbowski, we can realize that we cannot speak of any modesty in the matter of clothing among the higher clergy. The use of threads with a golden braid, numerous layers of underwear, as well as equipping the deceased with new sets of robes during subsequent exhumations testify not only to the richness of the robes made in the 17th century, but also to the great veneration of people like Bishop Stefan Wierzbowski after his death.